My name is Tina Kant. I am the director of the Barnard Center for Research on Women here at um, Barnard College. And <laughs> that would make sense. Um, and it is my great delight to be able to welcome you all to this year's Natalie Boimel Campin Memorial Lecture. Tally Campin, as she was known on this campus and across the street, uh, was the longtime chair of women's studies at Barnard from 1988 to 1995. She was a pioneering feminist scholar and one of the world's experts on the history of art in the Roman provinces, who taught courses on the ancient world and in feminist theory at Barnard and Columbia, where she held the Barbara Novak Chair in Art History and Women's Studies. Tally, as many of you know, who, who are in this audience tonight who knew her, uh, was a fierce feminist scholar and activist who played a central crucial, fundamental role in shaping feminist studies here at Barnard. And we are very, very proud to honor her each year, and this is the second year, actually, um, by showcasing the work of a scholar whose intellect and creativity exemplifies the spirit of the Tally Campin Lecture. And this year, we are very thrilled to welcome Professor Barbara Ransby as that exemplar this year. <laughs> And now, without further delay, I'd like to ask my colleague Premina Nadison to come to the podium, but before she does, I just need us to recognize and thank her because she was really instrumental in, in bringing Barbara here to us. So thank you for your support, and Premila Nadison, thank you. Thank you so much, Tina, uh, for that. I just had to bribe Barbara to come here, and she was willing to come. Um, I just want to say thanks to all of you for coming out tonight, um, and I especially do want to thank Barbara uh, Ransby for joining us this evening. She has a very, very busy schedule, um, and uh, I'm very happy that she found time to be with us here today. Dr. Ransby is currently a distinguished professor of African American Studies, Gender and Women's Studies, and History at the University of Illinois at Chicago where she previously served as Director of Women and Gender Studies uh, at that institution. She is also the founding director of the Campus-Wide Social Justice Initiative, which foregrounds the university's public urban mission by linking with community partners around social justice projects. She is also the editor-in-chief of Souls, a critical journal of black politics, culture, and society. And she is president of the National Women's Studies Association. She's also principal investigator of the Andrew Mellon Foundation. Yeah, it goes on and on. I'm not going to list everything, actually. Uh, Andrew Mellon Sawyer Seminar Project, which is entitled Geographies of Justice, which will convene scholars working on education, prisons, and wealth disparity in Palestine, South Africa, and the United States. And she's co-convener of the National Reparations in Higher Education Working Group, of the, I'm sorry, the National Reparations in Higher Education Working Group. And so that just kind of gives you some idea, like, of the multiple things in which Barbara is involved. And if that's not enough, um, she has published two groundbreaking biographies. One is Ella Baker and the Black Freedom Movement, a radical democratic vision, which was out in by the University of North Carolina Press in 2003, and Islanda, the large and unconventional life of Mrs. Paul Robeson by Yale University Press in 2013. And both biographies trace a counter-hegemonic radical form of politics practiced in different political contexts. Ella Baker helped usher in and guide one of the most transformative social movements in the US in the 20th century, the Civil Rights Movement. She worked behind the scenes, but she offered a more democratic grassroots model of social change than what was generated by mainstream organizers. Eslanda Robeson engaged in anti-colonial and anti-capitalist politics forging a radical transnationalism at a moment in history when independent struggles were unfolding across the globe. And she found herself at the epicenter of enormous hope and liberatory possibility, as well as intense state repression. So Barbara's research uh, highlights the ways in which African American women were leaders in progressive movements and helps us rethink questions of black radicalism, leadership, and theory making. 
Barbara has a very long list of book awards and academic honors. Again, much too numerous to name, but I'll just mention a few. The Joan Kelly Memorial Prize from the American Historical Association, the Letitia Woods Brown Memorial Prize by the Association of Black Women Historians, and awards from the Liberty Legacy Foundation and the Organization of American Historians. So numerous uh, achievements. In addition to those accomplishments, Barbara has for decades been committed to grassroots organizing and social justice. She is someone who is both in the trenches and is a public intellectual, speaking at rallies and marches, attending community meetings, organizing demonstrations, and also thinking about the multiple ways to bridge her academic and activist work. She's been deeply committed for many decades much like the women she writes about, to building a movement for radical change. She is currently completing a book on the Black Lives Matter movement, which will be published in 2017 by the University of California Press, from which she will be drawing her talk today. And her talk is titled, A Black Feminist Reading of the Movement for Black Lives, Resistance and the U.S. Left Reimagined. So please help me in welcoming Barbara. Thank you so very much. Um, thanks to all of you for what a lovely room of people. My goodness, I'm in such elegant, elegant and fine company. Um, I want to thank uh, Professor Tina Camp and of course the staff at the uh, Barnard Center for Research on Women. Uh, thank Pramila Nadison for that lovely introduction um, and for all that you all did to, to bring me here. When Pramila says, I'm so busy, I'm looking at this room and I, we, we are all so busy, um, there's so much work to do, but I am actually really honored to, uh, to be invited. Um, I also want to acknowledge the young feminist organizers in the room who um, helped to make sense of my work and my career in ways that uh, I can never do alone. So um, I also have political family and real family here, so um, I feel very much uh, at home this evening. Um, I'm delighted to be back at Barnard as well. Uh, I was thinking, when was the last time I gave a talk at Barnard? And the first time I remember was 1984. And the students in the room are going, oh, I didn't know. <laughs> God. Um, I had just begun talking at that time. No. Uh, I was a, it was a feminist and the scholar. And um, Barbara Smith was on the panel. Um, and I was like you know, 11 months pregnant with my with son, who is now 33. Uh, and, you know, I remember that because uh, Barbara Smith made this self-introduction and she said, um, you know, all these years I have really only kept one foot in the academy. And she had a very tentative kind of uh, relationship with the academy. And I, at that point, was about to go off to University of Michigan to begin my academic career. But I took that skepticism, that very healthy skepticism, uh, with me and it has served me well um, all of these years. So I want to try to do three things um, this evening. I want to situate uh, our conversation in this political moment. And I apologize for that. I know it's a depressing political moment, but there is, there is good news, and we do need to start there. And then I want to talk about uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and the movement uh, for black lives in the context of a larger black feminist uh, tradition, and also to challenge um, those of us who consider ourselves on the left um, as we embark on a period of building united fronts and coalitions, you know, what does this movement challenge us to do? How does it challenge us uh, to see our work uh, going forward? And then finally, I want to say a few words um, about the future and invite you to engage in imagining uh, beyond the moment. So we are indeed in serious and sobering times, um, and it would be amusing if it were not so painfully real. Every day there's another blow, uh, and every, uh, every day another act seems to join the circus. I can't tell you how many times people have said to me, I can't watch CNN anymore, it's just too depressing. But really we don't have the luxury to look the other way. We really have to confront um, the ugly reality uh, in, in, everything, in every way we can and with everything we have. And I also want to say you know, that I come to you, as Pramula suggested, as both a, a scholar and an activist. And in some ways, my work with the Black Lives Matter movement, um, the, I'm embracing this term elder, you know, it's just kind of, you know, have to <laughs> shake it off every time they say it. But I'm trying to be a well-behaved elder um, and, and, and learn as much as, as I teach. Um, 
but in the context of, of that work, I'm really revisiting um, some of my practice as a historian because I'm used to writing about dead people, right? You know, and they have usually said and done all they're going to say and do. Uh, but in this new book project, uh, I'm really finding um, the subject is in some ways a moving target, but it's also a group of people in whom I'm uh, very invested, and so I really have to um, tread lightly and, and be very careful about the practice that I'm engaging in uh, so that I serve the project uh, and don't do a disservice uh, to the movement. We could talk about that more um, later. But a little bit more about this moment we find ourselves in. Um, I feel it is a proto-fascist moment. People use different terms to, um, to define it. That's not a term that I use lightly. And of course, fascism has a, um, exists on a continuum. So Mussolini's fascism is not Hitler's fascism, is not Franco's fascism. But I think we have some serious tenets uh, of a fascist, a proto-fascist movement. Um, there is the immediacy of the kleptocratic rule of Donald Trump with this sort of pillage and plunder and pummel uh, policy agenda, flagrant misogyny and arrogant disregard for the truth. But we are also about to see a real abandonment of fundamental services, not to mention the regulation of industries and attention to climate change that threatens to plunge the entire planet into chaos. And the trend toward unprecedented wealth disparity is likely to grow even more extreme and obscene. On the global front, the military quagmires all over the world have devolved into violence and chaos, push, pushing literally millions of people into the gut-wrenching status of the global homeless. A president who, when asked uh, why he admired another leader in the world known, for, known as a cold-blooded killer, responded, there are a lot of killers, uh, and talked about waterboarding as a kind of soft form of torture. We are in a moment uh, in which the government is increasingly turning its back and its guns on the most vulnerable among us. And when I say guns, I think we do have to confront the reality, as we do in Chicago, uh, of immigration raids that are being carried out very violently, right? And, and in fact, uh, Trump has referred to these as military um, operations. And aggressive policing toward black and brown communities um, is yet another form of violence. This means more police harassment more police shootings, more police killings, and fewer DOJ investigations. This is an ugly and sobering reality. But all the news is not bad news. At the same time, we have seen uh, some amazing organizing and an ups, uh, unprecedented upsurge in protests. The January, 24th, uh, January 21st Women's March um, and sister marches around the country were both important and controversial, and I think there are lessons in those. And my re initial reaction was one of skepticism, uh, but I think we saw through a process of struggle uh, around the, the J21 march, um, a platform that was, was genuinely progressive. Uh, the sister march in Chicago, similarly, there's been, there was struggle before, during, and after uh, the march that I think brought it to uh, a genuinely different place. The March 8th, 8th women's strike uh, similarly, not perfect, there were challenges, but a mass uh, mobilization nonetheless. In Chicago, with a large immigrant population, many of them my students who have been involved in the uh, movement of undocumented activists, massive uh, uh, protests at the airports uh, from coast to coast, including um, in Chicago. So all of these were hopeful signs, right? People rising to the occasion, saying no, declaring themselves conscientious objectors, refusing to collaborate, uh, and normalize this new regime. It's in that context of resistance that I want to talk about the Black Lives Matter movement and the movement for black lives. And I'll say a little bit about the distinctions between the two in just a minute. This is a movement important to all of us, not just black people, not just black feminists. Um, and I have, in, in writing this book, I really have, have had to struggle with how the movement is labeled, you know, how it's framed, um, how sometimes it's dismissed. Um, and I want to offer some observations from my vantage point as a scholar, activist, and at times a participant in the movement. I want to argue that this is a feminist, a black feminist movement at its core, uh, and that we need to see it as such, and that it in fact offers uh, some guideposts, some leadership, and an agenda for a larger progressive uh, and left movement. But what is, it, what is the context in which this movement um, is struggling at this moment? 
In the immediate awake of the disastrous November election, we heard the argument from Professor Mark Lilla here at Columbia and, and others uh, that so-called identity politics uh, were the downfall of the Democratic Party and the left. Uh, Democratic Party and left not being one and the same, of course. Uh, in essence, um, that uh, Hillary Clinton was supposedly catering too much to black people, women, and gays. Quote, the age of identity liberalism must be brought to an end, he proclaimed in no uncertain terms on the op-ed page of the New York Times. There was much bemoaning of the neglected white male voter and the white working class in general. To the left of Lilla is uh, feminism's own Nancy Frazier, who has argued vociferously against so-called so identity politics, outlining in the pages of dissent why social movements were enabling a kind of uh, quote-unquote progressive neoliberalism. And then, of course, there are the voices like Adolf Reed and Jim Sleeper and my colleague Walter Ben Michaels and Todd Gitlin, who argue identity politics are divisive. Identity politics are the handmaiden of neoliberalism. Identity politics alienate white workers. What's in it for them? Um, it's important in talking about identity politics that we interrogate the, nat the nature of the term, right? What are we really talking about? Black radicals and black feminists have argued as hard as anyone against a narrow identity politics. If we define identity politics as a form of essentialism, I too am against identity politics. If we define identity politics in some skewed, narrow, one-dimensional fashion, it is not the politics to which I have devoted 40 years of my life. But in reality, for most critics of so-called identity politics, it is really a placeholder for all of the social movements that have organized around race, gender, sexuality, and other forms of oppression that are not class only or class first. Just as Trump longs for, an America, for America's bad old days of unchecked patriarchy and white supremacy, some tech sectors of the left seem nostalgic for making the left white again and not having to bother with the challenges around homophobia, sexism, and racism. Now, to be fair within the large category of liberal to left opposition, there are those who argue for simple inclusion, integration, or as Frazier would say, recognition over redistribution. But that is not a black feminist intersectional analysis or a transnational or indigenous feminist politic. And to the degree that this argument, this crit critique has any traction at all, it is the degree to which proponents who write off write off, erase, or ignore the black left and black radicals in general and black feminists in particular. Now I should say parenthetically, black feminism is a political and intellectual tradition. It is not an identity status. It is a set of beliefs, a political frame for analyzing the world and resisting oppression. Intersectional black feminism is grounded in the US, North American, Caribbean context, and we make no apologies for that because at the same time, it does not preclude, and in fact, almost in almost every instance, insists upon a transnational feminist solidarity. We often, uh, we most often identify intersectionality as an intellectual anchor of black feminist thought, and I subscribe to that, but let me also say this. Sometimes my students say intersectionality was invented, right? And our colleague, my friend and colleague, Kimberly Crenshaw, in a sense, coined the term, but it really didn't begin there. Black feminists and pro-feminist uh, uh, black women, before the praxis had a name, operated within an intersectional framework. Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman, Ida B. Wells Barnett, Claudia Jones and Islanda Robeson, uh, Ella Baker and Rosa Parks. And of course, explicitly in the mid to late 20th century, Audre Lorde, Barbara Smith, Angela Davis, Bell Hooks, June Jordan, Beverly Guy Sheftall, uh, Kathy Cohen, and the list goes on. Let me also say this. In order to name and map a black feminist tradition, we have to be willing to think and talk differently about theory. And it sometimes makes people a little nervous. But Ella Baker, Essie Robeson, Fannie Lou Hamer had a worldview. They were not just organizers. They were not just you know, visceral um, consultants to the movement. They were intellectuals. They borrowed from different political and theoretical traditions uh, in order to understand the world. But they were not slaves to theory. They used theory for the practical work of liberation and of helping other people to get free. 
Secondly, they did not write long treatises. They did not pen 100 volumes um, as, as some Marxist theorists have. They did not have the luxury to do so, nor did they write dissertations or feminist tomes uh, as many feminist, uh, feminist intellectuals uh, have the opportunity to do. So to situate them in a feminist tradition, we have to be will willing to read theory into their practice. In other words, we cannot talk about a feminism of the academy without also talking about a feminism of the street. And then um, this many, many times requires uh, not only a different dialect, but sometimes a different language. So let me go back to the ideas that underpin a black feminist framework. And this is not news to many of you, but I think it, it bears enumerating. So black feminism recognizes the intimate, interrelated, and symbiotic relationship between various systems of oppression. How heteropatriarchy, capitalism, racism, and other forms of domination reinforce and reinscribe one another. Black feminism seeks to center some of the most marginalized sectors of our society in any agenda for liberation. Black feminism looks to decentralize forms of leadership and power, given that black women have landed at the bottom of most of these hierarchical formations. We know all this. All this said, I situate the movement for black lives and the Black Lives Matter movement squarely within a radical black feminist tradition. Its emergence represents a historic pivot, and they have created in the process new possibilities, the possibilities, uh, possibilities that did not exist before. When we stand on the precipice of a new chapter in history, we rarely recognize it in the moment. How could we? With the advent and growth of the movement for black lives, we are in fact witnessing a new chapter in the history of the black freedom movement in this country. One which continues to be sure, but one, one, one which has continuities to be sure, but one with fundamental differences from the movements of the past. It is the first time anywhere that a broad-based social movement, not limited or even focused on specific issues of gender and sexuality, is being led uh, by unapologetically feminist organizers, many of them queer and trans, and with a politic that centers the most oppressed, marginalized, and minimized members of the black community. It represents significantly a decisive blow, if not a fatal blow, uh, to the politics of respectability. That is, the patriarchal, homophobic, pull up your pants, comb your hair politics of black liberalism that has been roundly discredited by this movement. The tradition that would have kept Bayard Rustin in the closet while still exploiting his skill uh, as an organizer. This no longer has centrality in black uh, political life. The most um, massive uprising against racial capitalism and the violence of the neoliberal state has been led by this new black insurgency. This is a left movement with clear class politics, despite some of its critics' assertions to the, contr uh, to the contrary. It is a movement that, to, uh, that looks beyond the left wing of the Democratic Party for political solutions. A movement that has openly criticized black cops, black, black political elites, and patriarchal black leaders. In building black futures and the vision for black lives platform, two important foundational documents that have emerged from the movement for black lives, there is a clear unity agenda, a principal basis uh, for a united front against right wing populism. The fight for 15 and low wage workers issues, climate change and indigenous rights, reproductive justice, student debt, disability issues, and solidarity with Palestine are all a part of the document. And one of the only reasons, I think, that the document has not been embraced to a greater extent as, as a platform for the left uh, is, uh, is where it originated, which is in um, a black-led, a, a black feminist-led uh, movement. It is only by ignoring this work altogether, misreading it deliberately, that it can be conflated with bourgeois liberal feminism um, uh, as is implicit in uh, the dissent piece by Nancy Frazier. So what we, what we term the Black Lives Matter movement or the movement for black lives has evolved over the past four years into a broad-based movement with international reach. Its influence has uh, infiltrated professional sports, primetime television, and all aspects of popular culture, uh, taking some interesting turns in the process. But more importantly, it is a slogan, a demand, and an unrelenting question and yearning that has captured the sentiment of tens of thousands. 
Now, there is some confusion about exactly what we're talking about when we say Black Lives Matter and the movement for black lives. So let me just say a little bit about the political ecosystem um, ever so briefly. The term Black Lives Matter is one thing. Uh, the movement on the ground is another. Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement, and the movement for black lives are often used interchangeably, conflating the difference between three, the, the three and rendering constituent organizations and chapters uh, invisible. It's important to underscore that the uh, Black Lives Matter movement and movement for black lives is not a single organization. It includes a constellation of dozens of organizations that are in one another's orbit, have collaborated and debated, collectively employ an array of tactics from direct action uh, to the creation of a detailed policy document. The Vision for Black Lives platform, as I have uh, just mentioned, which was released in August, uh, also has developed uh, um, a large following and a community that is engaging that document uh, in a very serious way. Most people know the origin story of the hashtag Black Lives Matter. It's well documented um, in the wake of uh, uh, George Zimmerman's acquittal for the killing of unarmed black teenager Trayvon Martin, uh, Oakland-based activist Alicia Garza, who's going to be here um, in a few weeks apparently. Um, wrote what she termed at the time a love letter to black people, ending with a version of the term Black Lives Matter. Uh, two of her, her friends, uh, other activists, Opal Tometi and Patrice Cullors, uh, then helped to turn that into a social media uh, platform. She then joined forces with those three um, uh, after the Ferguson uh, uprising began and organized a freedom ride into Ferguson, out of which grew uh, the Black Lives Matter network. Now, the founders of Black Lives Matter uh, movement are one part of this larger constellation of forces, but it is not by any means the entire story. In parallel time, even before the formation of BLM Network, there was a formation of other national and re regional organizations that have been absolutely essential uh, to the movement organizing that has unfolded. And they include, uh, most significantly, the Chicago-based Black Youth Project 100, with a highly trained cadre of young adults between 18 and 35 in chapters around the country. They organize around what they describe as a, through a black queer feminist lens. There's also the Dream Defenders based in Florida, uh, which is a black and Latinx uh, led multiracial group, Million Hoodies for Justice uh, based again here in New York, and a myriad of other organizations, regional and otherwise. Uh, the Let Us Breathe Collective in Chicago, the Millennial Activists United, which is no longer functioning um, as far as I know, in Ferguson, Hands Up United, also in Ferguson, led by the uh, charismatic poet Tef Poe, uh, and Lost Voices, a group that literally formed an encampment during the Ferguson up uprising in 2014 um, in, um, in that community. I also want to speak to what I find very interesting as another third tier of movement organizations that are serving an interesting and important function. They are nurturing, sustaining, and nourishing organizations and connecting them in movement infrastructures and movement culture. These are groups less visible, often under the radar of the public, doing a kind of political quilting uh, that seeks to connect the dots of movement work. They serve a similar function to groups that uh, sociologist Alden Morris uh, described as movement halfway houses in the 1950s and 60s, and he referred there uh, to organizations like the Highlander Folk School, which is where Ella Baker met Rosa Parks, and, and tactics and strategies uh, of movement work uh, were, were argued out and discussed. The organizations today that do this work are, um, I, I discussed three of them in the book project, they are the Brooklyn-based uh, Blackbird Collective, which is uh, an organization that has done some really important convenings and has really been the catalyst behind uh, forming a coalition called the Movement for Black Lives. They describe themselves as low ego, high impact. Uh, um, and and, and all, of these, all of these organizations don't exist without challenges. And uh, one of the challenges of doing the research is um, you, you see the hard work and you see the sweat um, and, you, and you also see um, when people hit, you know, miss the mark as well as when they hit the mark. So all of that is a part of it. Another organization that functions um, in, in this kind of support role is BOLD, Blacks Organizing for Leadership and Dignity. 
It's a group run by Denise Perry, who is a former union organizer, queer black woman based in Miami, um, who has trained over the past several years um, hundreds of black activists who are now really in the forefront of the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. In fact, the three co-founders of uh, the black, uh, black Lives Matter Global Network met one another in, um, in one of the bold uh, organizing trainings. The two of them knew each other before, but the, all three of them met in that. The third organization in this category um, is the Blackout Collective, a group based in Oakland with a very distinctive history. Um, and, and they have been referred to as simply badass tactical trainers. Um, they're a group of women who, um, uh, some of them queer, uh, very much in the mode of black feminist organizing, who have traveled around the country providing certain kind of support work um, to uh, movement organizations. So it's, so it's very interesting to, to map and to see the sort of eco structure of, or the ecosystem of this movement as it's developing, and I think um, convinces me certainly we're not just talking about spontaneous uprisings, we're not talking about uh, a moment, but we're indeed uh, talking about uh, a movement and all of its complexity. Um, all of these movement organizations represent both continuities and breaks with the past. Uh, Asha Ransby Sporn put it succinctly in an interview in, uh, in These Times Magazine a couple of years ago when she said, quote, rather than picking up where previous generations left off, as, is often, as it is often put, I see our generation as presented with a project of going back into history, diving deeper where our predecessors did not, in order to extract silent narratives from beneath the surface of the histories of resistance. Our analyses must be intersectional. We must create a culture of solidarity that recognizes nuance and difference. So let me shift a bit and talk about the black feminist underpinnings of the movement more concretely. Black feminist politics have been the ideological bedrock of this movement in three very specific ways. Black women in leadership and as spokesperson insisting upon recognition as such. Two, the active uh, and conscious inclusion and representation of LGBTQIA black, black community. And three, the embodiment of a black feminist intersectional praxis in campaigns, documents, vision, uh, and in, in the majority of these organizations, and I should add, the inclusion of an anti-capitalist uh, analysis in much of it. This is not to say that everyone involved is a feminist or that there have been, uh, not been struggles uh, over the tone and content of the movement's self-articulation. I mean, some of it, quite frankly, has um, been very intense. You know, we had a, a struggle in Chicago uh, two years ago where there were, there were actually fist fights in the street um, because people were contesting the right of young queer activists to lead um, a very massive demonstration through the streets of, of Chicago. So, um, but nevertheless, they have uh, persevered and been consistent. While black feminist ideas were both a catalyst and an ideological frame, the many, vet many veteran uh, Black Lives Matter organizers brought some of these ideas with them into this emergent movement. At the same time, these ideas have circulated widely among new activists. Given women and men not previously introduced to black feminism, an entry point and a larger vision uh, of change and transformation. Uh, they have encountered black feminist terms and concepts like intersectionality in the context of struggle rather than simply uh, in textbooks. To paraphrase Kathy Cohen, the emerging movement uh, is connected to a black feminist tradition in the following ways. What feminism is quoting her now. What feminism says is that we have to expand how we understand state oppression and more specifically state violence. Black feminism is informing the movement for black lives in terms of how it's structured and its leadership, recognizing that male charismatic leader or the single charismatic leader is not the form of leadership they adhere to or are going to put forth. Finally, feminism should also require us to think broadly and radically about what it is we are fighting for, the outcomes we seek and the oppression we face. Radical black feminists in particular have argued that while immediate policy changes can be part of what we fight for, the structural transformation of the lived condition of marginalized communities has to guide our struggle." End quote. Again, broad, not narrow. Um, and uh, if, you listen to, if you listen to that quote, 
which I think is representative of a kind of ethos that has guided the movement, and you hear divisive elite politics, um, then you're not listening carefully. Um, in fact, it is a radical intersectional analysis and praxis that eviscerates the criticism that the anti-identity crowd advance. Let me go back to the Black Lives Matter um, movement and elaborate on Kathy's three points. Leadership, the politics of respectability, and bringing the margin to the center. First of all, many media observers and some self-proclaimed spokespersons for the uprisings in Ferguson, who shall remain uh, unnamed, <laughs> um, argue for this idea of spontaneous, decentralized, and, some, and to some extent directionless uh, movement. Many pundits deemed the movement initially leaderless. Why? Because they did not see the kind of leadership that they recognized or expected to see. They did not see or hear a Huey Newton or a Stokely Carmichael or a Julian Bond. It was not that there were no leaders, there were, but they represented a different style, a different tone, a different profile than the leadership that was being uh, sought by media. And many casual observers perhaps simply did not know where to look. This movement has represented, as Kathy argues, uh, a hard break with the messianic, male-centered leadership tradition of a Malcolm X, a Martin Luther King, or Marcus Garvey. At the same time, however, that it was a break with certain forms of, of black leadership, it was a continuation and a reclamation of others. The leadership style, for example, of Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer, Majeska Simpkins, and many more. Grassroots, decentralized, militant, and democratic. The assertion of a black, a, fear, a queer, feminist leadership has been significant, palpable, and unapologetic uh, throughout. Now this brings me to this question of the politics of respectability. Rejection of a top-down male leadership uh, is one thing, but the politics of respectability with the critical axes of class and sexuality are very important. And I just want to um, briefly quote uh, Fred Harris, who described the politics of respectability in what I think is a pretty succinct way. What started as a philosophy promulgated by black elites to quote unquote uplift the race by correcting the bad traits of the black poor has now evolved into uh, one of the hallmarks of black politics in the age of Obama a governing philosophy that centers on managing the behavior of black people left behind in a society uh, as touted as being full of opportunity. In an era marked by rising inequality and declining economic mobility for most Americans, but particularly for black Americans, the 21st century version of the politics of respectability works to accommodate neoliberalism. The virtues of self-care and self-correction are framed as strategies to lift the black poor out of their condition by preparing them for the market economy, end quote. So let's also remember, so he's arguing about, um, he, he's arguing for the um, sort of ominous nature of this politics of respectability for the 21st century. Let's also remember that before his uh, ugly fall from grace, uh, Bill Cosby was a major proponent of a revived politics of respectability, waged and advocated uh, um, pulling up sagging pants, speaking in standard English, not using race as an excuse, um, and using words like lazy uh, for so-called underachieving. So before the movement for black lives, the politics of respectability were alive and well under the leadership of our first black president, who himself underwrote this message uh, in a number of speeches. But the movement for black lives has flipped that script with ferocity making the case that structural racism and racial capitalism are not only the main barriers to black success, but are, if you are poor and working class, they are barriers uh, to black survival. This also shattered any remaining, they also shattered any remaining illusion about post-racialism that might have been lingering, you know, somewhere in la-la land. One of the distinctive features of the Black Lives Matter movement, the movement for black lives, is an adamant refusal to succumb to making distinctions between the deserving and undeserving victims of state violence. The movement has argued that it did not, it did not matter what Eric Garner did. It did not matter what Rakia Boyd was saying. It did not matter why Walter Scott was running, what Tamir Rice was holding. 
that action should not have constituted a death sentence. I also just want to pause and put on my historian's hat for a minute um, to point out that the struggle over re re respectability politics as a part of a larger uh, uh, struggle around race and class is not entirely new. I recall when I hear the language of the movement for black lives, Ella Baker's insistence uh, that democracy had to apply to everyone in the towns that she organized in uh, for the NAACP in the 1940s. She argued specifically that college-educated, church-going folks uh, didn't have rights greater than the person she labeled the town drunk, the guy who might talk too loud, drink too much, but nevertheless uh, deserved to be treated fairly. And she, she, made this, she used this term uh, referring to the town drunk in, in multiple speeches, and that was her uh, way of interrogating this notion that some people were deserving of rights if they had conformed to uh, you know, a certain kind of uh, comportment uh, uh, and behavior. So in the spirit of Ella Baker, this is not a movement prepared to throw poor black people under the bus, quite the opposite. As one activist told me bluntly, we don't just want cops to stop killing us, we want a restructured economy where we can work and live like human beings. It is no coincidence that no coincidence that most of the high profile murders that have occurred as triggers for Black Lives Matter protests have been among the most socially and economically uh, marginal sectors of our communities. The high tech labor light economy has failed many of these people and so has the neoliberal state. Young Laquan McDonald, the 17 year old Chicagoan shot 16 times was also the survivor of foster care and juvenile detention centers. Eric Garner and Alton Sterling forced into the underground economy, selling loose cigarettes, and in one case, bootleg CDs in order to make a living. And there is, of course, the case of Corinne Gaines in Baltimore County, survivor of domestic violence, struggling in a low-wage job as a hairdresser after being pushed out of school, ultimately shot dead in her apartment by the Baltimore County Police. While class is one pillar of the politics of respectability, gender and sexuality are certainly the other. So it is the articulation of a black, queer, and trans politic in many of the organizations that is another powerful blow to the politics of respectability. Heteronormative and even conservative heteropolitics have been a mainstay of respectability politics. Quoting Alicia Garza, she links race, class, and sexuality in the following way. BLM goes beyond narrow nationalism that can be prevalent within black communities, which calls on black people to love black, live black, and buy black, and keep straight, cis, black men in the front of the movement while our sisters, queer, and trans, and disabled folk take up roles in the background. Black Lives Matter affirmed the lives of black, queer, and trans folks, disabled folks, black undocumented folks, folks with records, women, and all black folk living under the gender, along the gender spectrum. It centers those that have been marginalized within black liberation movements. It is a tactic to rebuild the black liberation movement. Now, uh, some of the Leaders of Black Lives Matter movement, Black Youth Project 100, and a number of the organizations uh, brought black feminist politics with them into this phase of organizing. But there is another um, group of activists and organizers who were new to struggle, who were new to, um, to organizing, who have also been introduced to these ideas. And in some of my research for this book, I interviewed a number of people who were active in Ferguson and other local struggles. It was quite interesting how people talked about uh, the introduction of terms like intersectionality, uh, the, the discussion of issues of sexism in the movement and how it was dealt with. And I'll just tell you two quick stories. Uh, one is the story of uh, Janetta Elzey, Netta uh, Elzey, who became a kind of Twitter celebrity uh, after the Ferguson protests, very much aligned with uh, DeRay McKisson, was a uh, helped to found something called We the Protesters, and has a very specific notion about her activism, which is um, different than some of the other groups. But it was very interesting to read a number of interviews that she gave and talking about her own consciousness as a woman activist, observing sexism in the movement, pushing back against that, finding a kind of solidarity among other black women in the movement who did, in fact, describe themselves um, as feminists. And she, in the final analysis, uh, did not embrace that label. Um, but commented you know, that, th that those experiences, those conversations had in fact 
uh, changed her life. Uh, I've never been so empowered before, she said. It is so nice to have sisterhood and struggle. Another person less well known um, than Netta Elzey uh, is Alicia Saunier. Uh, Alicia was a St. Louis activist, teenager, um, uh, about to go to college when Ferguson happened, the Ferguson uprising happened uh, in August of 2014. Um, and she became very immersed. I mean, she went into the protest very naively, uh, initially you know, going to take water bottles to protesters, uh, encountered rubber bullets and tear gas, um, and rather than running and hiding, she really became emboldened uh, by that experience. But also one of the things she really made a point of wanting to share with me in my interview with her was her gender consciousness that developed in the context of the movement, right? Uh, that she was on the front lines with a number of men who uh, she felt were disrespecting her, had a double standard about who should be there, were either um, sexually harassing her or uh, being very protective in a paternalistic way. And she began to question all of this as she's finding her political um, voice. And um, then through readings and teach-ins and other things, um, came to embrace a kind of feminist, black feminist um, identity in the context of that struggle. And I tell these stories because so often, you know, black feminism is maligned as a kind of ivory tower um, ideology or, or, or practice. Uh, but in fact, it was in the context of fighting for the larger black community against state violence that these women also um, encountered and embraced a kind of um, uh, black feminist politic. So let me then go back and reiterate, um, let me do it for time, reiterate uh, specifically some of the influences that I've tried to tease out. One is the insistence uh, upon inclusion and the centering of the most marginal, borrowing directly from um, theorist Bell Hooks and others who talks about the need to move the marginal voices uh, to the center of liberation struggles and feminist praxis. Bell Hooks, even, even though Bell Hooks has had her um, disagreements and run-ins, let's just say, with um, young feminist activists around issues of popular culture. Um, then there's a question of internationalism and solidarity um, across lines of difference. And um, I'm very struck by Alicia Garza's comment that this is not a narrow nationalist movement. That is, in fact, uh, a black-led internationalist movement. Uh, that black, the Black Lives Matter network has um, chapters in uh, the UK and in Canada. Uh, Black Youth Project 100 has uh, sent members uh, to Palestine in solidarity with the struggle there. And so from the very beginning, kind of in the spirit of Angela Davis and June Jordan and many others, there has been a black feminist internationalism uh, that has guided uh, this movement. And I should also say, uh, as an aside, in terms of the developments at this moment, um, I'm very hopeful about a kind of united front uh, conversation and strategizing that's going on between uh, people working around um, issues of immigration and um, uh, undocumented folks in the Latinx community uh, and the young organizers in Black Youth Project 100. It also was a solidarity delegation uh, to Standing Rock. So again, in the spirit of June Jordan, Angela Davis, but also I want to remind us, given it's you know 2017, it's 40th anniversary of the Combahee River Collective Statement um, of, of, of 1977, just as a shameless plug, the National Women's Studies Association is actually um, embracing the 40th anniversary of the Combahee Statement, and, and the theme of the conference is uh, Combahee at 40, um, feminist scholars and activists engage the movement for black lives, and so you should all come to that in Baltimore. Um, but the Combahee River Collective uh, Statement, while it focused on local instances um, of racial uh, violence initially in Boston and elsewhere had also a very um, anti-imperialist uh, and anti-capitalist uh, message, and, and I see that reverberating through the language of this of this movement. Um, finally, uh, Black uh, Lives Matter and Movement for Black Lives organization have also contested who is viewed as a legitimate victim and survivor in. Uh, the larger campaign against uh, police violence. And this has been um, a, a big discussion because in some ways some of the most publicized names have been male victims of police violence. And, and of course that is a part of it. And, and the tragedy uh, for all of our people is very real. But they have also insisted that there are a whole set of names that we often ignore. And Kim Crenshaw has been 
you know, uh, very vocal and very instrumental um, through the uh, African American Policy Forum, but also groups like Asada's Daughters in Chicago, uh, again, BYP 100, uh, and a number of groups have done uh, a lot to advance uh, the hashtag Say Her Name, not only introducing us to Sandra Bland, uh, but a whole list of others. Also very significant, not only in terms of, of gender, but also in terms of class politics once again, uh, was the support to the 13 women in Oklahoma who were victims uh, of Daniel Hostclaw, who were um, many of them sex workers, women who had uh, criminal records, who feared that they wouldn't be believed if they came forward to talk about um, sexual violence they had experienced at the hands of this police officer. And that was in, in a different era, in a different context, those women might not have found the support that they ultimately found. And in the context of the ethos of this movement, they did find that. So let me just shift now and say a few words about the future, and I want to leave time for us to have uh, some conversation. Another strength I find um, in this moment, and, and, and something that gives me hope about the trajectory of this movement, and again, despite contradictions and blemishes and challenges and all of that stuff, uh, it's human beings trying to change the world is messy business. Uh, but one of the strengths of the movement that also gives me uh, hope is that it is a visionary movement. You know, James Baldwin um, uh, once said, the impossible is the least that we can demand. And I think that this cohort of activists have taken that to heart. In August, uh, August 25th, uh, 2016, there was a cover story um, in a local paper in Chicago called Chicago Reader. And it, the headline read, quote, abolish the police, question mark. Organizers say it's less crazy than it sounds. Uh, the headline was triggered by a Fox News town hall in which a local Chicago activist uh, called for the abolition of the police, uh, sparking a near riot on the set. But this is part of the discussion uh, going on in movement circles. And when that headline appeared, there were reverberations uh, uh, through that activist community um, um, about what they were trying to achieve. It seems so far-fetched, so otherworldly, so impractical. Later in the article, um, uh, Mothers Against Senseless Killing, Mask, which is a, uh, a Southside um, group of uh, women activists in Chicago, uh, Tamir Manasse, a leader of that group, observed, quote, the only reason I know that we, c we don't necessarily need the police is because of what I do every day. Um, and by that she meant working um, in her community around violence reduction and prevention um, and restorative justice. Michael Denzel Smith, writing in The Nation in 2015, writes, quote, this isn't about getting better police, ones who exercise discretion in using force, but getting away from needing the police altogether. He goes on, when I say abolish the police, I'm usually asked what I would replace them with. My answer is always, full social, economic, and political equality. That's a tall order. When young activists do call for the abolition uh, of the police and prisons, they are not crazy. They are calling for transformative justice. It does not mean fire all the cops tomorrow, but rather it is a challenge to build a city, a society, and a world where police are superfluous, and prisons, to quote Angela Davis, are obsolete. Like the demand for prison abolition, the call for the abolition of the police is aspirational and visionary, but it's provocative. It, ex it insists that we look at the world that we now have and imagine something better. According to CUNY graduate uh, center professor Ruthie Gilmore, abolition is not just about tearing down, but about building new structures and providing new life-sustaining resources so the conditions that create the need for prisons, and I would add police, no longer exist. Uh, black Feminist Futures uh, convener Paris Hatcher uh, similarly held black feminist salons where um, attendees imagined future possibilities. There's a strong kind of Afro-futurist Afro um, uh, tendency within uh, many of the movement circles, sort of reminiscent of the early 20th century uh, surrealists that Robin Kelly and others write about. Uh, two documents that I mentioned earlier, the vision for black lives and build black futures. One is the movement for black lives document that came out this year. The other one, an earlier uh, BYP 100 document, reveal the visionary aspirations of the movement. Um, in the war on black people, 
reparations, invest in communities divest from police, economic justice for all, community control of our institutions, political power. All of these documents together represent a, a comprehensive agenda for change. More comprehensive, I would argue, than Bernie, uh, Bernie Sanders' campaign platform, more coherent and concrete than anything produced by the organizers of Occupy Wall Street, more detailed than the Green Party agenda. Uh, it is not simply a manifesto for black liberation, it is an agenda for liberation and a more just future. The document says explicitly in its preface, we are a collective that centers and is rooted in black communities, but we recognize we have a shared struggle with all oppressed people. Collective liberation will be a product of all of our work. So the neoliberal agenda has been advanced on the backs, uh, the unwilling uh, blacks of vulnerable black subjects and is, and is with this understanding in mind that Charlene Carruthers writes that there can be no economic justice without racial justice. And as one uh, Black Lives Matter and Movement for Black Lives document reads in bold, when black people get free, everybody gets free. That is both a challenge and an invitation to a larger feminist and left movement I hope they can accept the challenge and the invitation to struggle in principled coalition uh, um, and uh, to uh, mobilize in every way that we can um, against this current moment. So on that note, I will end and I will also in, uh, let you know that part of the organizing that's going on is under the rubric of something called Beyond the Moment. It's borrowing from King's 1967 speech, Beyond Vietnam. Um, and there'll be teach-ins all over the country on April 4th, the anniversary of King's assassination, and massive actions all over the country uh, on May Day. And so my political comrades in the room and my academic colleagues in the room, I invite all of you uh, to be a part of that spring of resistance. Thank you. Do you have any advice for student activists, especially here? Because like, I feel so personally, I really struggle talking with black, other radical black people who have grown up in privileged spaces because of their socioeconomic backgrounds. So how do you advise that with solidarity between other groups with black feminisms and Palestine and like all of that? Mm -hmm. how, how do I advise students to kind of get involved? Is that, well, I'm that? involved. You're, I mean, okay, like, okay. How, like, <laughs> Let's just be clear, you're involved already. I, okay. I, mean, I mean in terms of like how to like get recognition and balancing academics and student activism and oh. not being like having like I feel like activism especially on this campus is like a full-time job without any benefits so <laughs> it's like and no pay and like no recognition yeah. I hear you so, I hear you everywhere so I mean well I I mean a couple of things I guess I would say to that um I don't know that I'm a, ro a good role model for balancing these things um but I mean, I think we have to look for recognition in other places, right? So, um, so the people you're struggling alongside of, the collectives that you're a part of, you have to say thank you and I love you to one another. Um, and one of the things I guess I've, I've learned a lot working um, with some of the young people in some of these organizations, and one which my generation did not do a very good job of is this idea of self-care. And I have to say, I was a little bit, you know, like self-care, we're in struggle, you know, it's supposed to be hard. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but I think self-care is important, and I think in order to sustain oneself for a long period of time, um, we have to not see that as a luxury, but see that as a necessity. Um, so to build that in, because we need you 20, 30 years from now, you know, still in the struggle, and that's, uh, you have to pace yourself and take care of yourself um, in order to do that. But I also think, you know, this thing about recognition and, um, you know, are we winning or losing? I mean, sometimes it gets discouraging, and I think when you get you know, to my age, um, not, as I mentioned, I'm not an elder, but I'm, you know, inching toward that status. Uh, you know, you, you look and you say, well, I've been doing this a long time. I've been in a lot of different organizations, and have we won? And the answer is yes and no, right? That, that winning gets recalibrated, and sometimes winning is preventing certain things from happening as much as it is, you know, achieving what the goal that you set out to, uh, to achieve. And the other thing is, um, you know, living a life of integrity and having a community that is, that is fighting the fight with you, that there's enormous, you know, there can be enormous joy and reward in that. So, you know, so, you know, have a talk with yourself about those things and embrace the community that you're that you're involved with so
Yeah, this idea. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that. She's going to ask a real complicated question. No, no. It's actually a is it on? Yes. Uh, it's a, a kind of just a basic question, and that's I'm taking up your terms about the kind of left liberal critique of identity politics. And one of the things that I've um, been struggling with at this moment is basically a kind of uh, rigorous, you know, critique of racism in leftist organizations. And it seems that that's what's being occluded at this moment that many people are organized against Trump, but just thinking about how constitutive racism is to the political order and how do we think about that as we're trying to think about coalition politics in this moment? Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for that question. I mean, it's something I think about a lot in this moment. Um, you know, in the, and I alluded to, I could have gone on about it. Um, a, a lot of uh, organizations, um, you know, including people who were residuals of the Bernie campaign, folks in the climate change movement, um, who are looking for big tent uh, united front work, have made this argument that, um, you know, Black Lives Matter and other organizations working around race in particular, you know, are, are divisive, that we need to put those things on the back burner. And that's been the terms of some coalitions that some coalitions have required in the past. And so, uh, you know, I'm very hopeful about the, um, the organizing committees against deportations in Black Lives Matter, which is creating a different center for that kind of principled um, um, coalition. And I think there's no shortcut to it that we have to fight and confront it. Um, I don't think we can avoid doing United Front and coalition work. And I, I really like to try to think beyond coalition and beyond this language of allies as well. You know, what does it mean to have a movement that sees fighting white supremacy and anti-blackness at, at the core of it? That's a challenge. I think it's a challenge we have to take up. Um, but, um, but yeah, there's no, easy, there's no easy answer to it. That's the work that is, in fact, ongoing. And it's, you know, it's been some hard discussions and some casualties. <laughs> I'm, I'm ha struggling and have been for a little while with issues of generational politics. And I can't tell if it's because I'm middle-aged and mm -hmm. crotchety or <laughs> if there's something really going on here. Because I kind of like to imagine that when I was younger, I was a little bit more respectful of my elders and maybe I, I wasn't. Um, but right now, I guess, within the context of this, this movement, which gets repeatedly framed as, as a young person's movement, I'm just trying to figure out where middle-aged people like me and seniors, where, where can we be useful without allowing ourselves to be disrespected, I mm -hmm. guess is my question. Or how can we do Right. That? So, um, you know, I, I've been in a lot of discussions about intergenerational work, and there are, I mean, some folks who do youth organizing use this term adultism. It's not a, it's not a term that I use or find particularly useful, um, because I think, you know, childhood youth and, uh, and adult status are, you know, these are phases of life. It's not like racism. It, it doesn't translate to the same kind of um, uh, institutionalized, immutable structures that we see in other um, systems of oppression and domination. Um, that said, I do think that there is both dismissive attitudes toward older people in some youth circles and uh, condescending attitudes toward youth among my peers. Um, you know, I always say sometimes we fetishize youth also. You know, people say, oh, these young people, they're out there. I mean, there are young people out there doing some pretty reactionary things, and those are not the young people I'm in solidarity with. But there are young people out there who, sh who are like-minded and you know, and that's who I'm, you know, in, in political community with. I think I, I do take some inspiration from Ella Baker, who worked in these intergenerational um, circles. And I'm, I'm reminded of there's, um, in the film Fundy that Joanne Grant did about Ella Baker uh, a number of years ago, many years ago, there's a scene between Ella Baker and Virginia Durr, who was the older white woman who supported the Montgomery bus boycott. And they're talking about the young people in SNCC. And Virginia Durr says to Ella Baker, she says, oh, I just don't know how you can deal with those young people. She says, and it's this very thick 
and, you know, Alabama accent. She said, they're just so wild. You know, how can you just, how can you be around them? You know, and, and, and Ella Baker said, you know, essentially, she said, she didn't literally said, but she essentially said, they're, you know, they're my comrades. You know, they're, they're the people I'm in struggle with. And so she um, was able to adjust in that way. I have found um, that many of the young people I've interviewed and come to know are respectful of people that they do feel a certain comradeship with. When Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton went to Ferguson and were, you know, quite in a more gentle way to put it, kind of booed, uh, it wasn't because they were old. I mean, Angela Davis went and she was embraced and, you know, a number of people gave all of these. And one young woman said to me, the woman Alicia Saunier, who I quoted, she said, she didn't come to scold and mold us. Uh, she came to learn what we were doing, to be in solidarity, um, and so forth. So I think it's kind of how you roll that determines um, that. And I certainly, I have been sometimes been disrespected by young people. I have almost as often been <laughs> disrespected by older people um, because of, you know, because of political differences. But, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's part of what we have to struggle and, and try to achieve some balance with. But I have not found, I've found, I have to tell them to stop calling me, you know, an elder or Dr. Ransby or something like that. I kind of want to put a little bit of that on chill, but um, <laughs> anyway. After reading Black Women Historians in the Ivory Tower, uh, it encouraged me to believe that there was a need for academics like me within academia. And so I thank you for leaving behind a legacy for a new generation of scholars to build upon. And so my questions are, uh, what are the new challenges face facing black women historians today? Mm. And what are our roles within the liberation movement? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I think there are a number of, there are a number of challenges. Um, for me, I think um, in various, uh, context there's there's a struggle about the future say of I don't know what field you're in but but you know African American studies Africana studies diasporic studies um, whether whether those um, units and those uh, interdisciplinary units within various institutions are going to be just other academic un units or if they have a special mission um, and I would argue that they have a special mission um, so the, I think that's one struggle and I hope that black women historians, black feminist historians can be a part of that struggle, which is, which is really also a struggle around fundamental issues like epistemology. You know, how do we know what we know? How do we understand the world? And is it simply through our engagement with formal academic, you know, scholarship and training, or do we also bring um, other sources of knowledge with us into the academy and, and, and fight for that to have a place, right? Um, and, and so I think that's a, that's a part of the struggle. I think there are, um, there are publishing challenges and archival, ch I mean, there's those kinds of challenges that we face to tell stories that still haven't been told, um, to uh, have those stories published and respected in an increasingly difficult publishing uh, market. And I think, you know, in some ways, um, that fear of being gobbled up by, <laughs> by the larger academy is something that I, that I worry about. Um, sort of be careful what you wish for. I think some people do, in fact, wish for a certain kind of seamless inclusion. Um, but, you know, to quote Baldwin again, I think we have to ask what's the price of the ticket. Um, and sometimes it's quite, it's quite costly, if you know what I mean. So, um, so yeah, I think, uh, you know, I started off my remarks talking about Barbara Smith and how she, she um, created for me a kind of willingness to have an uneasiness about my relationship to the academy. And I've, I've carried that with me. I mean, I've done my thing and I've, I've had, you know, I have a career, it's not over. Uh, I have a career, um, but I have also uh, maintained a health, healthy skepticism and I've also maintained um, intellectual community outside of the academy, which has been very, very important for me um, to, uh, to gauge and measure, as, as the sister asked, success, right? It's not always a success of the academy. It's, you know, we figured out something together, we made an impact. Um, so, yeah, so that will be some of my general comments. I was really interested in hearing more about the, the, third, the third tier of organizations that mm -hmm. you talked about mm -hmm. and that political quilting 
And could you just like talk a little bit more about like what continuities are there from old movements there and what new strategies? Right. Did you so um, I find that work very interesting, very close to my heart. Um, one of the things I did after the Ella Baker book was um, we, a number, you know, I sort of did a book tour and, and I encountered all these people who had, you know, said, I never heard of Ella Baker, but I'm working in that tradition and so forth. Anyway, we started a network called Ella's Daughters and we described the work that we tried to do um, as political quilting, which is what is that kind of um, interstitial space between organizations? I mean, everybody's hunkered down building their organization, fighting their battle. How do you connect the dots? And how do you do it in, way, in ways that aren't just a kind of traditional or sometimes very pragmatic coalition? You know, we'll get this bill passed or not or whatever. How do you begin to build relationships? And so that's what I see these organizations um, as doing. I mean, Bold, for example, uh, they convene people in very, very intensive training. They engage in somatics and, and martial arts where they talk about embodied leadership and for people to really get to know each other and, um, um, and build community and build trust as a part of building communities of resistance. And these are people in different um, organizations. The, um, the Blackout Collective, I think, does a similar, I mean, they do different work, but they uh, they travel around and they build trust through people engaging in civil disobedience together and figuring out ways to do that while keeping relatively safe, protecting one another, um, uh, et cetera. So, um, so I see those as, I mean, they're continuations in a different way from something like the Highlander Folk School, which interestingly, one of the activists in the Movement for Black Lives is going to be one of the new co-directors, Ashley Henderson. But, um, but that is a place, you know, physical place, a site for people to convene. And, and these um, new formations that I'm talking about, uh, they convene people, but they convene people all over and it's a little bit mobile. And also use technology to try to connect um, people in important ways. Although bold tends to be kind of low, low tech deliberately. Um, so I see that work as really, really important. Um, it is work that is often not funded or well-funded. Um, it is work that has to be selfless because part of what organizations do, especially organizations that are getting funding, is they have to show, you know, if you're organization A, you have to show your funder that organization A was the, you know, prime mover behind campaign B, uh, and that's the nature of the beast. Uh, and so what these um, uh, sort of movement quilters do um, is connect people in a way that doesn't have to foreground their role in making that connection. So I think it's important work. I think it's difficult work. Um, I'm happy that it's happening, and I try to support it um, as much as I can. Um, so I'm going to ask a controversial and probably very what might seem as a divisive question that came up um, this weekend. I love weekend. controversial questions. <laughs> um, with a group of women, black women, um, uh, who are kind of self-identify as black feminists. And um, one of them is a professor at Rutgers, Britton Cooper, um, working on a project, and her research found that, um, you know, one, I think every 28 hours a, a black woman is actually um, killed at the hands of a black man. And in the conversation we were talking about the women's movement, and um, to your point about Black Lives Matter and the movement for Black Lives being founded on black feminism, I guess my question to you is, and, and this is what was posed in the group, would these movements, Black Lives Matter, the movement for Black Lives, be more successful if the focus was actually placed on um, the success and the ultimate security of black women as a central focus point? Mm -hmm. That's my question. Um, I think that, I think there is a focus on black women. I mean, I think that in Korea, I mean, I know Brittany very well and we had <laughs> parts of these discussions. Um, I, I, you know, I think that there's a struggle in the movement, right? So no movement is um, monolithic. There's struggle in the movement about focus, about types of campaigns, but there's been a consistent push to foreground the ways in which uh, women experience violence, not only at the hands of black men, but at the hands of the state, at the hands of police. You know, everybody knows the name of Sandra Bland, but the Say Her Name uh, campaign brought many other names uh, to the fore. In Chicago, there was a very successful campaign around uh, a woman named Rakia Boyd, who 
um, you know, who was who was killed, and using those cases to illustrate, you know, a larger a larger pattern. So I don't think it has to be to the exclusion. One has to be to the exclusion of the other. But I think that that is actually one of the hopeful things about the movement for me that I think it has increasingly um, illuminated violence uh, uh, toward toward black women. I mean, the Korean Gaines case was an interesting one, right? Because, um, you know, in a lot of ways, when we talk about deserving and, you know, victims who are more sympathetic than others, uh, she became an, uh, an unsympathetic victim in a lot of circles. And um, I, I was very pleased and proud of a lot of black feminist voices that came to her defense. People wearing t-shirts that said, you know, remember Corinne, um, Charlene Carruthers writing a very powerful uh, piece in Color Lines, I think it was, uh, in defense of, of Corinne Gaines. And people know the story, right? Corinne Gaines in Baltimore County, who, um, who was, you know, whatever you say about her ideas were complicated, but, but you know, she had a gun, she was in her home, um, and the police on a traffic violation broke in and killed her and wounded her child. So, I mean, in some ways it was a test of what kind of victim of that violence is the movement prepared to stand up for? Um, and everybody didn't stand up for her, uh, but, um, you know, and, you know, I, yeah, and people, we had a lot of interesting discussions about that. I, I was, I was moved on the question myself, so. But you want to say something about what the conversations were about? I'm curious. <laughs> Generally, we were talking about, there was an argument made um, that um, if black women, just there was a historical um, context provided about the violence that actual many of our kind of um, uh, black organizers and um, in the history, Dorothy Heights and others, the violence that they experienced at the hands uh, of mm -hmm. their peers, um, black men who were organizing with them and how that story is untold. Mm -hmm. And so the um, conversation led to kind of evolved, went many places, there was brunch so, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, and <laughs> it kind of landed in a place where um, the question was, if, you, if we were to focus on ourselves first, um, would that give us the space to be more successful for the broader movement? Um, and there was a distinction. There was a, a conversation about ex explicitly excluding um, black men because of mm -hmm. violence against women, because uh, black women are often, black women's issues are often lost in the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, even when we talk about young black boys, right? And My Brother's Keeper, we had a conversation about that. The violence that happens to young women in schools, in high schools, in hallways, in bathrooms, no one ever talks about that. Um, so that was some of the conversation. Yeah, I mean, this, so this is a, this is a big uh, conversation. I mean, I, again, I don't wanna say um, that, these organizations are perfect, they're not. But, and, and this is where intergenerational stuff comes in too, um, they are so much better at dealing with this. I mean, I'm impressed, for example, at the accountability process in um, some of the organizations. BYP has a very elaborate accountability process and, you know, I'm not revealing anything because this was, you know, in uh, media, you know, instances where men in the organization were accused of uh, sexual assault, sexual violence, um, sexual harassment, who were actually taken through an accountability process, um, very, a very detailed accountability process uh, in, inside the organization. Um, I'm reminded of conversations with Umi um, Sela in Miami, who, Philip Agnew, um, about his own evolution as a black male feminist in the circles of the movement. And so I think when you say just do it for us, by us, and then you lose the possibility of transforming, you know, brothers, sons, partners, um, and all of that. So uh, one last question I have to be Mariam Kaba. And I just have to say, I don't know if everyone here uh, knows Mariam Kaba. She'll be embarrassed my, my saying this. Barbara. But in the larger uh, book project and my own um, community and political sustenance in Chicago, Mariam Kaba, who is now in your community here in New York, um, has mentored and made possible so many struggles and so many brilliant young uh, uh, radical feminist activists that it's utterly amazing and um, we are all indebted to her.
Um, hi, everybody. Thank you. No, not thank you. Um, I'm going to go after you later on. Um, I just wanted to say to your question, because I think this is an important question and speaks to what Barbara's point has been um, throughout this talk and probably will be in the book, which is that there's stuff happening and there's stuff you see. They're not the same things. And the idea that, you know, Barbara mentioned, you know, I, I was part of holding one of the accountability processes that happened around violence um, with some folks in BYP. It was a over 15 month long process, you know? And it, people took it seriously. And that wasn't the case when I was organizing in the 1980s with black men in organizations here in New York where you could find a place to talk about violence that was happening intra-community. There's a language for that. There are people who've been doing work for a long time who are supporting people in making that happen. I don't think there's a way for us to go concentrate on ourselves alone. We're not singular, atomized people. We have connections to many people, and some of those people are men too, in our lives, not just in our organizing. So I don't think there's a, I think that's an ahistorical view of how black feminism has organized from time immemorial. And I think that that's good. It's good that we have to interact with each other on a regular basis. It's really good that people are thinking about our, us in struggle together because we have to practice the world and prefigure the world that we want to build. And we have to live together to do that. So I just wanted to put that out there and to say that these young folks who are doing this work are thinking about stuff that I never thought about at 22 or 25 or 30, you know? They have a different analysis of the world just because they have the benefit of having lived in this kind of weirdly organized national, transnational world that's at the fingertips that I didn't have, that other people didn't have. So I just want to put that out there and thank Barbara also for being such an incredible political quilter, but also helping us to understand the past in order to be able to use it in the present in a way that very few scholars do. She's really made herself available to all of us over the years. So I'm really, I feel really grateful that I got to spend over 20 years learning from her. Can I just tell people about April 4th? Yeah. So the final thing I'll say, my Twitter, um, uh, what do you call it, handle. Is it called a handle? Yes, that's right. That's right. I do use Twitter. I know how to use Twitter. Um, is there, and I, I will be um, announcing the events that the Beyond the Moment um, mobilization is, is doing for April 4th and May 1st, so people can look there for information. And one thing we're asking uh, academics to do who have um, really wonderful, powerful teaching tools is to share those for April 4th, and there's a mechanism to do that. So if you get in touch with me, I can, um, I can share that. So thank you for a great, engaging conversation, and thanks to Tina Kampt and Pramila Nadison um, and all my other lovely colleagues here. Please join me in thanking Barbara for a wonderful presentation.